You got this, two more. Oh my God. <laughs> lemon cake? Yes. There's lemon cake. Lemon, lemon cupcakes. <laughs> Smashed it. <laughs> I told you that this was going to be a light interview, mm -hmm. the, f the first part anyway. Yeah. So I love getting to know the person behind the book mm -hmm. and I want to know who you are. So awesome. are you ready for some questions? Sure, yeah? go ahead. I stalked you on your socials. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's talk about this nickname, Lemon Witch. Oh, yes. What's that about? Okay, so um, this this name came came about like two years, three years ago and a friend of mine, her and I were talking about Studio Ghibli and how much I love Studio Ghibli. And so she drew me as a Studio Ghibli witch with lemons in a basket. I'm like, oh my God, that's so awesome. She's like, you're the lemon witch because you wrote a book about, you know, where lemons are a symbol of hope and you love Studio Ghibli. So combine that together, we did, she came up with the lemon witch and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna change my Twitter name to that. And it stuck. And the sad part is, I know it has an underscore, but there, I tried to do it without the underscore, but there was an account that hasn't been updated since 2011. And I couldn't get the one without the underscore, so now I'm with the underscore. That's so random that someone right? else is a lemon And bitch. I asked Twitter, <laughs> really, and it, it's like it was a cafe somewhere, I don't know where it is, and they, they haven't updated anything since 2011, so I'm kind of sad about that. Yeah, have you tried, tried, to, tried to tell Twitter, they just ignored they me. Didn't care. Well, they will care. I hope so, <laughs> I hope so. Who is your favorite fictional character? I will say Peter Malark. Okay. I love him so much. I was very much influenced by The Hunger Games, as can be seen from my book sometimes. And Peter Malark is one of my favorite because he's such a complex character and so layered and you see him through Katniss's eyes so I always wonder what would have been, like happened if we saw it from his point of view, like what unfolded. And yeah, he's he inspired a lot in Kinan, in my love interest. So, yeah. My favorite character, by the way, yeah. but we're going to come mm -hmm. on to this. What is the best Syrian dish? The best Syrian dish for me is kibbeh. I love it so much. I could eat it forever. But also, I love kibbeh, but I also love luchia. I don't know if you've ever heard it. Do I'm you know? Egyptian. Oh, okay. <laughs> then you got luchia too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Luchia is like, my. when I was young, I used to eat like literally four dishes when my mom used to make it, yeah. like when I was like 10, 11 years old. And I just, I love it so much. It's, it's like the best. Okay, yeah. cool. You win points now. You've got Thank you. <laughs> what's the best Syrian dessert? Oh, I will say buza. Oh, I that? love, it's the, it's the Syrian uh, ice cream. Okay. And it's like kind of, it's kind of stretchy and it's so good. I mean, knafe is amazing. I know we talk about it a lot in the book, yeah. but I love buza more. It's got pistachios around it. Like they cut it, it's, it's like a loaf and then they cut it. And it's, and it's and it's like stretchy and creamy at the same time. It's it's heaven. Can you name me five dishes that contain lemons? Oh damn. Okay, so <laughs> no let's pressure. go. Um, lemon tarts, lemon pie, sorbet. Um, you got this. Two more. Oh my god. Lemon <laughs> cake. Yes. There's lemon cake, and I will you know, lemon lemon cupcakes. <laughs> Smashed it. Congratulations on having your book published in America and the UK. How does that feel? Thank you so much. Um, it feels surreal to see the words that I wrote five years ago be translated into a book and then a book that all, people all over the world are reading. It's, I mean, it's going to be in places that I will never visit, you know, like bookstores that I'll never see. So that's, it's a very big feeling and it's amazing. And I'm very, very grateful. Can you please summarize what this book is about? So, As Long As Lemon Trees Grow is a YA speculative contemporary. It follows Salama, a pharmacist living in Homs, Syria, who's volunteering at a hospital and she's seeing all these injured civilians coming in every single day. And at the same time, she's trying to find a way out of Syria before her pregnant best friend Leila gives birth. And so she has PTSD and this PTSD has uh, manifested itself into hallucinations that seem a bit too real in a man called Khauf. So all of this is going on and Salama has kind of lost the spark of life. Like she doesn't see what's the point anymore until she meets Kinan, who is a protester and he shows her that there is color in this world still. But the bombs are still falling and the clock is ticking for Leila's due date and she has to make a decision of whether she should stay or leave. What is the symbolism behind lemons? It was an homage to Nizar Qabbani's poem verse, which is, every lemon shall bring forth a child and the lemons will never die out. And he wrote this poem about Syria. And there's also another saying that in Homs, where the book is based, that every house there has a lemon tree. So these lemon trees, these lemons have existed for centuries. And so 
up throughout the centuries, a lot of things have happened and they have still continued to grow. And so that's what these lemons symbolize. They symbolize hope and persistence and resilience. And that's what I want this book to be, a symbol of hope. When you sent the book through and I got a packet of tissues with it, oh. and obviously I read on it, it said obviously to help you mm -hmm. read through this novel because you're going to need it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, the confidence and it almost made me think like I'm not gonna cry and then I read it and it was honestly really really beautiful Thank you. and I listened to a few interviews you did and you mentioned that you spent some summers in Syria you never mm -hmm. lived there yeah what memories do you hold of Syria and mm -hmm. did you incorporate any of them into this book I did um, so there are moments in, t uh, in the book where Sadama remembers her grandfather's orchids and the apricot trees can also talks about and so my grandfather also had a lot of gardens we're in our village in Syria and he also had a big mountain like that mountain belonged to my grandfather which is a very random thing to own but it belonged to him and so I remember we we had also um, pistachio trees and walnut trees and I remember it was very random this memory but there's like a lizard that was running up the bark and it was it was just like this moment in time where nothing existed but this garden and me as a young girl just basking in the nature that Syria had. And so I try to incorporate those peaceful memories that I had in Syria during the summer in the book and through Salama's good memories of what she misses the most. How difficult was it writing this book? Oh yeah, it was it was very, very difficult. So the very first draft was 130,000 words of pure pain. I mean, when I first queried it, I called it, by the time you read this, I'll be dead. And so it was a very hopeless book and I wrote it at a time where I felt no hope. And so when I started sending out to friends to read, they were like, okay, this is a lot of sadness and a lot of pain that we just, it just doesn't affect us anymore in the end. So we need that moments of hope and moments of quiet moments that are good and give you like a better glimpse to the future. And so I was like, oh my God, that's right. I can't just infuse this with pain because it's not fair to the people who have suffered as well because they're not just their suffering so that was something that i had to learn as well that no 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 we're more than our pain we are here just as the lemons are i mean they're hope and we're hope as well and so i yeah i cried a lot there was a lot of tears even like i was listening to the audiobook this morning in the in the plane and i was like oh my god like <laughs> that is i can't believe i wrote this and i'm, I'm so happy that i did and yeah, it made me teary as well yeah. to read, to hear my words spoken by someone else. That was, that was so surreal. There's a lot of misconceptions around refugees mm -hmm. and for people that live in dangerous situations. Yes. The idea is that everybody always wants to flee. Yeah. And I love that you've got characters in this book that mm -hmm. are like, no, I'm going to stay and fight for our freedom. Mm -hmm. Why did you consciously decide to show characters from both sides of the coin? Because it's a reality, because there's a lot of people who didn't want to leave who didn't want to leave at all, but they were forced to because of circumstances. And then when they arrive at a country that they don't know and the people in it don't know them, and then they meet them, they don't know their backstory. They don't know that they didn't want to come here. And then they look at the other people who wanted to leave because they're so scared and they judge them for it and they see them as weak. And leaving your country isn't something weak. It, is, it takes a, an immense amount of strength to actually leave everything behind, leave like just with the clothes on your back and you leave. And that is, I don't think, would we be able to do it? I don't know, like hopefully we will never be in a situation like this. But I, I just wanted to show the story behind the faces that people in Europe and the West see, that they have so much that they went through and we should appreciate that and help them. Salem is an 18 year old girl, mm. woman, I would say girl, but in this scenario she is yeah. a woman. She's got an immense amount of pressure and mm -hmm. duty on her. Your readers are hopefully gonna be mostly young adults, right? Mm -hmm. I felt like there was a lot to unpack and it was very graphic mm -hmm. in certain parts of the novel. Why did you decide to do that, mm -hmm. knowing that obviously a lot of young readers are going to mm -hmm. read this book? Uh, I think stories teach empathy. I think we all believe that. And I, this is what I wanted Lemon Trees to be, to be the story that teaches readers empathy. And there were moments in time where I had to remind myself as well that Sadama is 18. She is a very young girl. She's a 
she's she's a girl she's not a woman but she is put in situations where she has to mature and i feel like teens will be able to recognize that recognize these um innocent moments that salama tries to hold on to and then see how them like with themselves they're able to live in a world where it's okay but for others it's not the same and that would teach them to look to for other people and to you know care for what is happening in outside their bubble and they're the ones in the future who are going to be making decisions you know like in 30 40 years they're the ones who are going to be passing laws and influencing people and for example there could be a refugee coming into their city into their school as like as a new student and so they would you know show this person compassion and understand that this is a human being as well and it's only by just circumstances that they're in this situation and I'm not so I think we underestimate teens a lot and they are capable for more than we can possibly imagine. I mean, when I read Salt to the Sea, I was a teen, Salt to the Sea by Rita Sepetis, and she wrote a lot of heavy themes. It built empathy in me that I didn't know that this happened during World War II and I wanted to learn more and I learned more by researching and she did that. So this is what I want Lemon Trees to be for teens to close the book and research about what is going on and even a smile is helpful. So, and, and, and I trust them, they'll be able to do that. It's obvious that Salema's going through PTSD. Mm -hmm. How did you research and prepare for that? Because you translated it beautifully, and Thank I genuinely you. mean that. So usually I, I write a first draft and it's very messy. And then I start plotting and editing everything from the beginning. And so what I did was I read a lot of research papers. I read a lot of stories. I wanted it to be fictionalized. I didn't want it to be hard, cold facts. You know what I mean? Because I feel like with stories, it brings the image closer to readers. And so I read a lot of stories where the characters were dealing with anxiety or, or personal problems with their mental illness within themselves. And I tried my best to possess Salama's body and that's what I do with my characters when it's like from the first person POV and so I was like I was Salama and then after I'm done writing I do an exorcism and I'm outside and I'm myself and so we would me and Salama would be doing things I'm like oh my god girl what are we doing like is this what we're really feeling right now yeah, yeah I'm like yeah I'm like girl what is happening right now so that's how it was and I'm, I'm very glad so what what happened was that I had to rewrite it three times in order to be able to flesh out her character even more and give the moments that are heavy their due and also the quiet moments their due so it could amplify the loud moments, if, if you know what I mean. Why did you write this book? Did you feel a duty? Mm. I know a lot of people have survivor's guilt. I don't know if that's something you've experienced. Yeah, I do. I do a lot um, because I'm, I'm Syrian, but I'm also Canadian. So I've, I haven't suffered like Syrians in Syria have suffered. So when the revolution happened, I was 16 years old and all I could do was write Facebook posts to people who already know what's going on. So whose minds are you changing? No one. And so I stayed like that for like 10 years because like, you know, I finished university and everything and then I moved to Switzerland. And then I realized, I was like, oh my God, being in Switzerland and a lot of people are asking me what is going on in Syria when they find out that I'm also Syrian. I was like, oh my God, I could do something because English isn't a language that a lot of Syrians master and it's my first language. And I'm like, I could write a story. I mean, if it changes only one person's mind, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm good if only one person reads it. And that's why I started writing it because a lot of people don't know. And I don't blame them. If you don't know what's going on, then that's okay. But like now you should know what's going on because you can research. And I hope that my book is that push that gives people to know what's going on. My last question mm -hmm. is, um, I did my research mm -hmm. and I know that you've got a degree in pharmacy. Yes. And you're studying your, to do your master's or have you finished your master's? I'm actually going to start my master thesis this month. Okay, yeah, love that. Thank you. So tell me, are you going to pursue a career in mm -hmm. pharmacy or are you now a writer? What's going on? Uh, I want to finish my master thesis and I would like to dabble into ph in pharmacy a bit. And But I would love to be also an author, like taking up more of my time. But I love the sciences, so it's my, my heart is pulled into two directions. So yeah, who knows what happens in the future, but yeah, I could be a full-time author. You pick well, two heavy yeah. stories to follow. And I'm I mean, <laughs> you know, it is the Middle Eastern. <laughs> I'm glad you said it. Yeah. I'm, glad you said I'm it. like, if it's not perfect, I don't want it, you know?